Chapter Three of Our Little Irish Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Our Little Irish Cousin by Mary Hazelton Blanchard Wade. Chapter Three St. Patrick. Sure, and it's Father Tom himself, said Nora's mother. She was in the midst of the family washing. Katie was rocking baby Patsy, and Nora was brushing up the rough mud floor. Everyone stopped work at once and ran out of the cabin, the mother wiping her hands on her apron, and Nora lifting Patsy and carrying him along in her strong young arms. The whole village had by this time turned out into the lane and gathered around the kind fat priest who had a smile for each and all there were old people hobbling along with the help of sticks men who had stopped work for the sake of a blessing from the priest mothers with babies in their arms and children big and little it was a glad day when father tom came to the village to see how all were getting along there were so few people that the village had no church of its own they went four miles every Sunday to the nearest service. Almost everyone had to walk, for there were only two or three donkeys and one or two rough carts in the whole place. A visit from the priest was a great honour, a very great honour. The children knelt in his pathway that he might lay his hands on them and bless them. The men took off their hats and bowed their heads low as he passed by. The old women made as good curtsies as their stiff backs would let them. Nora put little Patsy down on the ground, whispering, Patsy, dear, touch the good man's robe with your little hands. It will make ye a better boy. Father Tom must have heard the whisper. He turned around and placed his hands on the baby's curly head. Then he made a short prayer and blessed him. I will take a sup of tea with you, Mrs. O'Neill, he said to Nora's mother. I am quite tired, for I have walked all the way from my home this morning. Mrs. O'Neill was much pleased. She hurried home while the priest and children followed her more slowly. As she hung the kettle over the fire and set the table for the priest's lunch, he gathered the children around him and told them stories of St. Patrick, the dearest of all saints to the Irish people. It was a long, long time ago that the King of Ireland was holding a festival in the Hall of Tara. Put out all the fires, he had commanded his people. Let no light be seen till a blaze bursts forth from the hill of Tara. Not one of his subjects would have dared to disobey the king's command. You may judge, therefore, how surprised he was when he looked out into the darkness and saw a light. It grew stronger and stronger every moment. A great fire was blazing nearby on the top of a hill. Who would have dared to disobey the king? What was the meaning of the fire? The jury priest for whom the king sent in haste said, O oh, king, if that fire is not put out tonight, it will never die in this country. Now it happened that the festival which the king and his people were celebrating was held on the night before Easter Sunday. Few people of Erin had at that time heard of Easter Sunday. They knew nothing of the life of the Christ child. They were druids and had a strange belief of their own. Their chief priests dwelt in the dark forests of oak trees and taught their followers to worship fire as the symbol of the sun. But a new teacher had come into their country. He had a message to the people. He wished to tell them of the Christian religion and of Jesus, who had lived and suffered and died to help all mankind. The name of the new teacher was Patrick and Scotland was his early home. When he was sixteen years old, he was surprised by a band of robbers. They made him their prisoner and took him with them to Ireland. After he had been with them six months, he managed to get free and went back to Scotland. But he was carried off a second time, and again he escaped. After he reached his own home once more, he said to himself, I should like to help the people of Ireland. I should like to tell them of jesus and his religion he began to study and prepare himself for teaching at last he was made a bishop after many years he was able to go back to ireland 
It was what he had long wished to do. It was the eve of Easter Sunday when he lighted that great fire on the hilltop and surprised the king by his daring. I will send for the man who kindled that fire. Let him come before me at once, commanded the king. Patrick was brought in haste, but he was not frightened in the least. When the king and the princes, the nobles and the druid priests were gathered together, he told them he had come to Aaron to put out the fires of the druids. He wished to stop the making of the pagan sacrifices in which the people then believed. He had brought something better in their place. It was the Christian religion. What do you suppose the king replied? He was very angry, of course, but still he asked Patrick to meet the wise men of the country the next day and talk the matter over. Then he could explain his belief to them. On the next day he did meet them. He talked so well and so wisely that many of the listeners thought he knew a great deal more than they did. They became Christians then and there. The king then gave Patrick the right to preach all over Ireland. As he went from place to place, he spoke so well that all those who listened to him felt his great power. In a short time, the whole of the people became Christians, and the strange worship of the Druids came to an end. Father Tom told Nora and her sister many wonderful stories of the life of St. Patrick. He told of a spring of water he had visited. The spring worked miracles. It happened that St. Patrick and St. Bridget were one day taking a walk. She said she was thirsty. St. Patrick struck the ground with his staff. Water instantly began to bubble up through the earth, and a spring has been there ever since. Father Tom went on to tell of strange wriggling things called snakes. He had seen them in other countries. They were something like big worms, and were of different colours. The bite of some of them was poisonous. But we have none of them in our own beautiful Ireland, he said. You may thank the blessed St. Patrick for sending them out of this country. Nora and Katie both shivered when they thought of the snakes. How good St. Patrick was to drive the horrid creatures out of Ireland. There is a grand church in the city of Dublin called St. Patrick's Cathedral. When you grow up, Nora, you must surely visit it, said the kind priest as he finished his storytelling. It stands on the very spot where St. Patrick himself once built a church. It is a fine building, and its spire reaches higher up toward heaven than anything you have ever seen made by men. But, my dear little children, your mother has prepared me a nice luncheon. I must eat it, and then visit poor Widow McGee, who is very ill. A half hour afterward, Father Tom had left the little home, and Mrs. O'Neill was once more hard at work over her wash-tub. Nora was out in the yard, amusing baby Patsy. Mother, mother, she called. Mrs. Maloney is on her way here. She has just stopped at Mrs. Flynn's. Come in and get some potatoes ready for her, Nora. I don't want to stop again in my work. Mrs. O'Neill pronounced it work. Mrs. Maloney lived in a lonely cabin about two miles away. You would hardly believe it, but Nora's home was almost a palace beside Mrs. Maloney's. There was one little window, as she would have called it. It was really only a hole in the wall. When heavy rains fell, the old woman stuffed it with marsh grass. The thatched roof had fallen in at one end of the cabin. The furniture was a chair and a rough bedstead. Poor old Mrs. Maloney. Once she had a strong husband and eight happy children. But, one by one, they had died, and now she was old and feeble, and had no one in the world to look after her. Is it any wonder that the generous people whom she visited always had something to give and a kind word to speak to her? Every few days she went from house to house, holding out her apron as she stood in the doorway. She did not need to say a word. One kind woman would give her a bit of tea, another a loaf of bread a third a cabbage, and a fourth a little butter. In this way she was kept from starving, or from going to the workhouse, which she dreaded nearly as much. As Nora dropped the potatoes into her apron, the old woman blessed her heartily. As she turned to leave, Mrs. O'Neill called after her to ask how she got along in yesterday's bad storm. 
Sure, and I was that feared I dared not stay in the cabin. It was so bad I thought it would fall down on my shoulders. So I went out and sat on the turf behind it. I was wet in day when the storm was over. Too bad, too bad, said Mrs. O'Neill in a voice of pity. We must see what can be done for you. She did not forget. That very night she asked her husband if he could not find some time to mend the old woman's hut and make it safe to live in. He promised her that as soon as the potatoes were hoed, he would get his friend, Mickey Flynn, to help him, and they would fix it all right. Ah, Tim, Tim, said his wife, with her eyes full of tears. Of all the eight children Mrs. Maloney has lost, there is none she grieves over like her boy John, that went to America and was never heard of again. Maybe he lost his life on the way there. Maybe he died all alone in that far away land with no kind friends near him. No one but God knows. Mrs. O'Neill crossed herself as she went on. Think of our own dear girl in America and what might have happened to her. End of chapter 3